Chapter 4 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 a trial trip, whether or no, in my boat. Five hours to windward. Bailing out. Gain on water. Conant's opinion of the boat versus a London friend's. Arrive at Exmouth. Boatman's opinion there. Take lodgings for a week. Explore the X in boat. Return to Sidmouth, whether or no, in her. Early morning. Mackerel fishing. Caught in a mackerel breeze. Sea too heavy to land at high water. A run for shore under sail. Foam's life on the beach. A gale at Sidmouth. Boats afloat and moored round a freshwater pump. Conant's parlor that evening. Mrs. Partingen's mop at Sidmouth. Long sea trips in the foam with wife and children. Some friends remonstrate, etc. My wife criticizes the foam's speed. A launch with the plug out. The first real trial trip of the foam was on a certain Monday, on which I had arranged a week before to sail in her with a friend for Exmouth. Harry Conant was to go with us, as I was a stranger to that port. Anybody can go almost anywhere by sea, provided they can pick their weather, which in this instance we were unable to do, so that our start on this particular day was not exactly a case of weather permitting, but rather one of, if possible. The evening before, the weather looked unpromising with a fresh west-southwest wind, and all Conant would say as to the next day's trip was that with that wind an early start would be advisable, in order to make the best of what little tide we should have with us. By an early start, Conant would mean 3.30 a.m., but out of deference to the domestic arrangements of my friend, the late hour of 7 a.m. was fixed upon. The sun rose among crimson streaky clouds, or as fishermen call them, the reds, that morning. And all Conant would say about the weather, or the probable time of our arrival at Exmouth, was not encouraging though he allowed it might be done in the run of the day. My friend was not what it is called a boating man, but rather one of that game class of dry London men who thoroughly enjoy what they call a sniff of the briny. There was, as Conant said, a bit of a jump outside, but which, in the present state of the tide, did not run high enough inshore to make it hard to launch. And when everything was on board, including my friend and self, Conant gave the boat her last shove through the wash of a breaker, until, as he said, she smelled water enough to float her after which he stumbled in over her stern, and with her head a trifle off the wind, she soon gathered life under sail with a crunch, crunch, over the breakers seaward. 
The mouth of the X was ten miles dead to windward, and our pilot said the only chance of fetching it was to stand at once well off shore in order to save the last of the ebb. Professional boat builders rarely go to sea in their own craft, and probably don't experience unusual pleasure when they do. But as we left the shelter of the bay, and the little foam splashed her way through the rougher water outside, I confess to a feeling of wonder and pride in her strength and sea-going powers, which I have never felt since in much larger and finer sea-boats built by others. But all that sort of thing was soon checked by Conant remarking, that if we meant to do anything, we were bound to drive her now, and that he should advise the larger mainsail to be set, and an oar used to help her to windward. His word was of course law, and the smaller mainsail under which we started was shifted for the large one three bags of ballast being trimmed to windward to enable the boat to keep her lee gunwale up under the larger sail, Conant taking my place at the tiller while I took an oar and began rowing, or rather catching a stroke when possible, the net result of which driving process, or, as Conant called it, keeping her at it, being that not a moment passed without a cloud of spray flying over us to windward, with a fair share of solid water at times over our lee bow, all which kept Conant busy bailing with one hand while he steered with the other. Conant seemed delighted with the boat, because, as he told my friend, you see, sir, she don't stop to look at nothing, but she goes right through everything. The London man, however, persisted in calling her a wet boat, and said he would as soon be on a duck's back, etc. We went on in this style until the high cliffs of Sidmouth were almost out of sight, the wind rather freshening all the time, but, as Conant said cheerfully, it would not do to ease her nothing, and so far as the water inside her went, he thought he rather gained on it. It was a good day for a sea boat's trial trip, and as we went about, we met a bluff-bowed collier under reef topsails on the other tack, her black shining bows rising and falling in a stately way as they plunged through the sea, which ran in streams of foam from her headgear. On board the little foam it was doing rather more, and the large mainsail was lowered, and the smaller one hoisted in its place, under which she became a trifle drier. Conant, who in summer time despised all protection, was now as wet as a shag, and in spite of our oilskins and sou'westers, we were far from dry. We had been under way more than two hours when we again came in with the land and found ourselves only two miles and a half to windward of our starting point. It was therefore suggested under these circumstances that it might be wise to hard up and run back for Sidmouth. But this step was overruled at once by Conant who said that so much sea would by this time be running on the beach, that with a flowing tide a return to it might be risky. While if we stood to sea again for an hour, we ought to fetch to windward of Otterton Head, 
and after that we should smoothen the water on every tack. The latter part of this prophecy was not verified, and three hours later, when we fetched a long ledge of black rocks known as Straight Point, there was a nasty, untrue sea breaking over them and upon Exmouth Bar to the westward. Two more short tacks, however, enabled us to fetch the western passage between the pole sand and the warren, where we could ease our sheets for the desired haven, and after being cramped up five hours to windward, it was pleasant to stand up again in the warm sun and wind which nearly dried everything as we ran along under the friendly shelter of the sandbank outside us. The trial trip was over, but on reaching the landing hard at Exmouth, the boatmen there looked curiously at the foam and inquired where we came from and when told Sidmouth, were half inclined to doubt our word. The oldest among them, shaking his head, pronounced her as too small, in which he was perhaps right. But there she was, and we felt that the foam might be trusted in any weather in which it would be possible to launch her from Sidmouth Beach. My wife had engaged lodgings at Exmouth for a week, with a view partly to some smooth water boating on the X. But distrusting the fickle ways of the open sea, had wisely made the passage with her three little ones overland. It was quite two o'clock before my friend and I two damp, unpleasant, hungry bodies turned up at those apartments. Conant was rather fagged out, but after lunch and a hot, strong glass of rum grog, assured us, as we wished him good-bye in the empty carriage on his return to Sidmouth, that he felt beautiful now. It was arranged, however, before he left, that the next Monday he was to come to Exmouth and go back with me in the foam to Sidmouth. During the week we had a pleasant time exploring the tidal estuary of the X in her as far as Topsham. But the morning fixed for returning to Sidmouth proved, if anything, more dirty-looking than the day we left there. And after I had walked down to the shore before breakfast, and was informed by some Exmouth pilots that with that sea on the bar it would be out of the question to land at all on Sidmouth Beach, I went back to the lodgings, determined to leave the foam in charge of a man where she was until the weather improved and return with my wife by carriage. The wind was strong at south-southwest with what sailors call small rain, and had been so since daylight. But we had scarcely begun breakfast before our landlady informed us that there was a man at the door who wanted to see me and there to my surprise shining in a suit of oilskin stood harry conant after having tramped in the rain from sidmouth when i expressed surprise at his coming in such weather he merely said well sir you remember you told me you wished to return today if possible and I continued, as we came here in a strong, foul wind, that a fair one oughtn't to stop us going back, adding, Still, if you prefer to go by carriage, I can take the boat home alone. 
while as to the Exmouth pilot's idea of not being able to land at Sidmouth, Conant said, You leave that to me, sir. That kind of folk knows nothing of our sort of beach work. And so, after a good breakfast, Conant and I went down to the hard, and soon had the foam afloat and ready for sea, the local boatmen, of course, watching critically our proceedings, the only one of which they approved of being a reef in our small mainsail taken in preparation for a beat to windward out of the river. This beat out took some time, but once outside the wind was abaft our beam and Conant set the large mainsail, with the smaller one boomed out, spinnaker fashion, before which we rolled along as dry as a chip, and were even able before the wind to enjoy a pipe. When, however, we arrived off Sidmouth, nearly abreast of Conant's capstan, the sea was too heavy to run for it under sail and I had a splendid chance of seeing how a landing in a boat like the foam should be made through a sea tumbling in at high water against a steep beach. All sails in the mainmast were lowered, and carefully stowed and lashed out of the way. All but one bag of shingle ballast were emptied overboard and after the bow or cut-rope had been hooked into the stem, Conant took the pair of short oars or paddles, and under them backed the boat in until within a few seas of the beach, and with an eye over his shoulder kept her there for some minutes, or until three or more larger seas than ordinary had run under us and broken upon the shore. Then, with a half-dozen powerful strokes, he brought her round, and pulled in so that we were carried on the shoulder of a sea, and left almost high and dry upon the beach in front of his capstan, where his son, a stout boy, and an old fisherman were waiting for us. Other help was at hand, and the foam was quickly hauled or hardened in out of the reach of the surf. It was arranged between Conant and myself that I should have the use of his capstan and wooden skids on the beach when launching or hauling up my boat at a small fixed rate each time they were used and as he and his boy were often ashore about the time I was ready for a cruise, this plan suited both of us. In the mackerel season, however, I was frequently on the beach before sunrise or in time to get the foam afloat before Conant put the sea. Once launched, in ordinary weather, I wanted no more help until the morning's fishing was over after which there were always plenty of hands on the beach. The maxim among the fishermen, especially in rough weather, being that of mutual aid, so that the last boat ashore generally got the most help. In this way I often had three or four hours sport with the mackerel before breakfast, landing sometimes with more fish in the bottom of the foam than a man can carry, all which, after a few taken for home use, went to swell Conant's catch. The rig of the foam was well adapted for reeling for mackerel, as it required no attention in wearing round before the wind over a school of fish. This was not the case with the larger, lugged-sailed boats in this kind of fishing, but they nearly all carried two hands. In the season, I, of course, had mackerel lines out sometimes during a midday cruise, but seldom met with the same sport that attended the first hour's fishing after sunrise. 
in fact later in the day a fresh inshore wind or what the fishermen call a mackerel breeze was best for sport but i remember one morning when a doctor friend and i had started rather early on one of these mackerel breeze days that after a few hours capital sport the sea had increased so rapidly by the time we intended landing the spray was flying over the sea wall there were only three other boats left out one of which i hailed asking what he thought about a landing he said that neither he nor his brothers in the other boats meant to try it for the next two hours or till the tide had fallen so that they could see chit rocks when he could run in at that end of the beach adding and you'd best wait till we be all ashore when there'll be plenty of help there this end of the beach was a quarter of a mile from my usual landing and harry conant's capstan both of us were a trifle more than ready for breakfast and the wind and sea were rising fast but there was no help for it and we had to knock about outside till one o'clock when after the three fishermen had successfully landed we made a dash for it under sail quite a crowd had by this time got together on the esplanade to watch the boats come in and i was not sorry when after a rush on the back of a big sea the foam ran well up the beach without shipping a bucket of water and was seized by the strong arms of five or six men who had landed before us there is a certain amount of luck in landing through a surf under sail but on the whole it is perhaps the safest for a non-professional especially if alone the boat being kept rather by the stern and even if filled before beaching she must be kept fore and aft to the sea to the last besides the want of a capstan a great objection to landing at this end of sidmouth beach was that in case of a sudden gale there was no retreat from it landward the cliff meeting the beach here only a short distance above high water mark so that after a landing in dirty looking weather boats had to be dragged along the beach parallel to the shore for some distance before they could be safely left for the most part however the foam carefully tended by conant led an amateurish lazy boat life among her tarry fishy flavored scale smeared consorts basking idly for days in the sun or when too hot shielded from it under a well-fitted boat cover while the long winter months were spent by her snugly housed in her native coach house a mile from the sea and my wife used to say that she was where she should always keep her her immediate neighbors on the beach in summer of course conant's two boats the friends and england's rose and i knew for certain that in case of a sudden gale with a spring tide she would be the first boat hauled up beyond the reach of the terrible sea which once in every few years would make a clean sweep not only of everything on the beach but off the esplanade above it piling up sometimes beach two feet on the road and filling the basements of many houses facing the sea not only with water but solid shingle one such night i recollect about nine p m hurrying off in a pair of sea-boots to see how things were going on 
and found the sea pouring in sheets of foam a foot deep between every opening it could find into the town, so that it was hardly possible to wade safely across the end of one opening to the next, owing to the rush of water. I found the foam that night with half a dozen other boats moored to a fresh water pump, and when I asked a fisherman how they got so many of them there in such a short time, he said, We'd no trouble about that. After getting them on to the walk, we'd only to keep them straight, and the sea carried them into the street. The boats then lay aloft in nearly three feet of salt water, safely moored and rubbing noses together in this newly made port round a western town pump. Conant's cottage door looked out upon the place, and stepping inside it was strange to see him and his old father-in-law standing in two feet of water by a table with a lighted candle on it, and in the grate the remains of a fire everything reflected in the calm water about them while outside the gale howled and the sea thundered against the sea wall a hundred and fifty yards off the rest of the furniture had been carried either upstairs or to relatives houses further inland all but an old dutch clock hung near the ceiling the pendulum still swinging and hands showing the time nine thirty which as the old fisherman said must be ten minutes past high water so that he hoped they'd had the worst on it i asked him if he had ever known a higher tide he only pointed to a dark stain near the top of the room as the high-water mark of a tide fifty years back. When we took folk out of first-story windows in boats, Sidmouth did not entirely recover from one of these invasions by sea for months. And when one considers that not only every boat but all the capstans in gear had to be hastily uprooted and removed from the beach to a place of safety in an hour or two, some idea may be formed of the work a gale of this sort gave the fishermen. The well-known story of Mrs. Partington's ineffectual efforts to keep back the sea with her mop is founded upon a fact which occurred at Sidmouth no doubt before the building of the sea-wall by Rennie. But when the wind, tide, and sea meant business, the work of that great engineer seemed almost as useless against their combined attack as Canute's will or the old lady's mop. We have only to live long enough to arrive at years of discretion. I suppose this is my case, for I often wonder now how I ventured to undertake, and still more how I contrived to persuade my wife to trust herself and three small children with me in the foam on the long open sea voyages we used to make in her between Sidmouth and Tinmouth, Dawlish and Babycombe to the west, and Bear and Lyme Regis to the east. Quite alone, such expeditions might be easily accomplished by any foolhardy young amateur but handling a small open sailing boat under those squall-breeding cliffs with all you cared for on board was a nervous matter, especially when the lady in command often insisted upon sail being shortened or taken in altogether at the very moment 
when with a freshening land breeze the canvas carried was the sole means of keeping the boat from being blown off shore everything in the shape of masts sails and rope on board the foam was of the strongest and best and constantly overhauled with a view to cruises made chiefly with the wind off shore which when at all strong rendered any attempt to gain the land impossible under oars her yawl rig was also selected for this reason as it enabled one hand to keep the boat on her course during a squall under a mizzen and foresail without losing ground while taking in a reef or shifting a large sail for a small one i have gone into these details to show that the actual risks incurred upon these sea trips were not so terrible as some of our neighbors and friends at sidmouth used to make out many of them however were retired old naval men who had arrived at something a trifle beyond years of discretion men who would try to undermine my wife's faith never too strong in me and my boat with look here mrs leslie i must really come and have a look at this boat of your husband's and see what sort of craft it is that you trust yourself with him in along the coast among my wife's various criticisms on the navigation of the foam one was that upon a long trip we never appeared to get on but seemed always stuck for hours off the same headland this was of course an optical error due to being some distance off shore nevertheless i was never able to explain to her how when sailing up or down a river the foam apparently made better progress than she ever did at sea or when sailing along the coast but somehow or other we always reached port and the three children proved in a breeze most efficient and patient as shifting ballast the launch of a small family boat like the foam with wind and sea on shore was a business requiring some care and foresight especially with one or more lady passengers on board the boat had to be placed ready upon three or more well-greased cross skids or ways and when all were on board i took my place on the middle thwart ready to row her out until beyond the breakers before making sail conant would then watch for a smooth and with the words are you all ready sir start and follow her seaward through the wash until she was fairly afloat after which he left us to our own devices and the tender mercy of the surf in this way we were often able to utilize and enjoy a southerly or sea breeze which as conant used to say if it did not overblow itself and become offensive was more steadier like and less puffy than a smooth water offshore wind on such days once clear of the broken water it was plain sailing accidents happen however in the best regulated boats and in spite of all conant's careful preparations i noticed one day after passing over the first breaker that the cork had started from the plug hole under the stern sheets 
I had two ladies on board that day, and there was too much surf to allow a moment's time to leave my skulls or find the cork and replace it. And when one of the youngsters moved the stern sheets to look for it, the water was seen spouting up into the boat eight or nine inches high to the consternation of my lady passengers. The cork, of course, had hidden itself among the timbers aft, and I had to call for a pocket handkerchief, which, stuffed into the hole with a spare thole pin, did duty for the cork until we had gained a good offing clear of the broken water. Little incidents of this kind break the monotony of boating. But how that cork came to start was a mystery, because a heavy flat beach stone was always placed over it before launching. End of chapter 4